All right, Evan, um, should we make a stop? Yeah, that sounds great. Let me share my screen. Or if you share my screen, oh no, you got it. No, I think I got it. Awesome. Everybody can see that? Nice. Well, welcome back, everybody. It's great to see all of you and your boxes and your names. Um, this is part two, continuing where we left off on part one. I'm Evan, and that's Dan. Uh, the outline for today is we're moving from the, I just wanted to refocus ourselves where we are in the Doodleverse, give a quick intro to Jim, discuss how we, and discuss a bunch of to topics associated with Jim, um, how we move, uh, how we're moving from Doodler to Jim, um, what models are embedded within Jim, the config files make, and then this workflow for the typical Jim workflow, which is making a config file, making a data set, training a model, and then we'll do, most of the class will be taken up with a live demo of Dan and I working through Jim and some um, some aspects of Zoo, which are sort of show how to use these models. And then we'll wrap up with a question and answer and sort of talk to you about what's next in the Doodleverse. Feel free to drop questions in the chat or ask them if you wanna unmute and ask. Uh, we'll try to get to them as best as we can. Okay, here we are. So just to reorient ourselves, um, uh, again, this is sort of the design pattern for an uh, image segmentation pipeline. We talked about labeling data in Doodler, and we're now talking about this, uh, this. And then at the end of this is this, you have a trained model in Zoo. We're really talking about this middle part right here, where we're taking label data, we're augmenting it, we're training a model, and we're trying to come up with the best um, uh, deep learning based image segmentation model and that's really the core work of Jim this is the middle part whoops let me turn off that so this is where we are today uh talking about Jim and uh, we sent out this earth and space science paper which sort of gives you a lot of background information if you want to dive deeper into some of the detail that we don't go through in a more academic way as opposed to a more code or technocratic way that we're going to discuss today so we're hoping that uh, everybody got the instructions and we're able to download Jim if you'd like to, but the general way in which you start Jim and move from Doodler to Jim is you're gonna wanna clone Jim, clone the Jim repository and make the correct directory structure that's listed in Jim. Then in Doodler, remember we talked about those utility files in the utils folder. You're just gonna wanna run this one utility gen images and labels from Doodler and take the results, take the images and the labels folder from that and move it over into the Jim data folder or move it over into the data, the folder structure that you have for Jim. You can move or copy if you want to use the Linux commands or you can drag and drop if you want to. And that's the simplest and easiest way to get uh, data ready for, for moving into Jim. So it's actually quite, we've developed it so that it's seamless, just drag and drop uh, for you to get ready. Just to back up a little bit, um, the whole Jim works instead of Doodler is running machine learning in the loop with your labels, but it's all using scikit-learn. Now we're transitioning over to something a little bit more high power uh, and deep learning models. So instead we're using TensorFlow and the, the Keras API for TensorFlow, which is the high level API that has this really nice feature of progressive disclosure of complexity. So it's quite easy to learn. And then you can go deeper and deeper and deeper into Keras and into TensorFlow to create the um, to create the type of model that you want. So we're using TensorFlow for this. Um, and we just wanna mention that 
you're for working with TensorFlow and for doing deep learning, you can use your CPU, but it works much faster if you have an NVIDIA brand GPU that's connected uh, to the TensorFlow install that you have. So I've had luck with things that are eight giga GPUs that are eight gigabytes and above. Um, and, but you can probably adjust the model to make it use smaller GPUs, but that's just just from the standpoint of what hardware you need to get Jim running fast. And for big models, this is what we're talking about, NVIDIA GPUs. So Jim makes it easy when we're, we're talking about these TensorFlow models. Well, what, what are we really talking about as a model? Well, Jim makes it easy for you to work with this family of deep learning image segmentation models called UNETs. UNETs are a classic architecture from deep learning, the Ronneberger paper uh, that we cite in the in the Jim manuscript is the one that outlined how this fully connected, fully convolutional, I mean, fully convolutional network works. And it's called U because it has this rough U shape where you have an encoder branch where we're taking images and dropping them through convolutions and pools, convolutions and pools and, sh and shrinking them down to small size to what is referred to as the bottleneck between the encoder and the decoder, and then blasting them that back up to the to these maps that have the specific number of classes that you have uh, in your in your labeled imagery. So it goes it shrinks through the encoder and expands through the decoder, and the encoder and the decoder are connected by these um, connections that you can see. So information is passing through the network, down through the scales, and also across the scales from from uh, from the encoder branch, the decoder branch. So that's, I think, where I want to say we're trying to make it easy here, but you still need images and labels, and there's still to, 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 uh, to work with to make models be performant and to work well. And we'll go over that. So in general, when we're talking about making a model, if you were just going to, from scratch, work with TensorFlow, these are the, the some of the pieces that you need, the high level pieces that you need to get to get going. You need a data, and I think explaining them now is going to help contextualize what's inside of Jim and what Jim is actually doing for you and why the configurations matter. So I just want to run through this text heavy slide to explain the components that you would need if you were de developing a deep learning image segment, any deep, actually any deep learning project. You need a data import pipeline. So you're, you need a way to convert your images and the associated labels into tensors to adjust the size of the imagery, to augment the imagery if you want. So subtly adjust them so that your uh, the deep learning uh, pipeline, the deep learning model is able to generalize, better generalize. You need to define the number of images that are in a batch and you need to normalize the imagery. So do that standard deviation scaling or do a zero to 255 scaling. You need to define the model architecture, which is that setting up that unit, that encoder and decoder. You need to stack all the layers up and connect them all together so it understands how to work. You need to define a loss function, which sets the error that is needed for the backward pass. So a neural network does a prediction step and then it adjusts all the weights through a backward pass. You know, the loss function to see to see how what the error was on the images that you predicted. And then an optimizer, which helps to actually adjust those weights and biases in the backward pass. You need to compile the model so that it's ready to run very quickly on your device and, and ready to go. You need to set the callbacks, which is when a model stops and when to adjust the rate at which the optimizer is operating on the weights. And then you need to call this step to actually fit the model and run all the batches of imagery through the model and uh, adjust the weights and do the actual work of training. And then at the end, you need to visualize the training metrics. So what the loss rate was and any other metrics that you defined. So for a regression problem, that would be mean squared error for a loss function for, or the metrics are a loss function for a segmentation test or things like dice, or intersection over union, which is the jacquard. And you need to visualize the uh, outputs. So look at some example outputs to see if you've done a good job, if the model has done a good job. So all of these things you need to do, and you could build it from scratch, but Jim is all about building this opinionated 
tool set, opinionated workflow for you to be able to do this and experiment very quickly. Because a lot of these things are hyper parameters that need to be adjusted. You might need to adjust the loss rate a little bit more. You might need to play with which loss function, the learning rate a little bit more. You might need to adjust the loss function if you want or make subtle changes in the architecture. So we allow you to experiment in Jim, but um, the scaffolding is set up for you. So it's quite opinionated in how we set up all of these different pieces. And I'll pass it to Dan. Thanks, Evan. So just before I begin here, I want to make a note and I put it in the chat that either you should refer to the wiki as much as you can um, when you're starting to get going with the with Jim projects. Um, there is a test data set that you should probably want you probably want to run um, in order to make sure that you fully understand really how the directory of files are put together and whether or not your computer has sufficient power to 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 kind of train these models. You should note that the uh, test data set is fairly small, um, so it should run fairly quickly if you have a GPU, but you can also run it on a, a CPU only, and it will take much longer, but it uh, will still complete within a reasonable amount of time um, because it's a relatively small data set. I think it's only about 70, 70 images or something like that, 70 images and labels. Um, so yeah, please refer to the to the wiki as much as you can. We've we've tried to done it. We've tried to do a, a fairly complete job of of kind of stepping through the different um, parts of Jim and why they matter and how you and how you can get going. And then you're going to get a real crash course over the next hour or so because um, I'm going to show you um, do a live demo of a couple of different projects that I've put together. Um, one is uh, using a data set, the data set that we labeled coll collaboratively last week. I added a lot more data to it to, uh, to get a more powerful model and you'll see a more kind of production scale model. And then I also wanted to show you um, an example of a, of, of a scenario where you might already have labels and images from another project or from another data set, i.e. you haven't gone through the process of creating your own data set using Doodler. You've just found a data set on the internet and you and you want to fit the model to them. Um, okay, so let's dive in. Um, I'm going to just show a couple of slides here before I share my screen and then we'll get going on those two different um, case studies. The config file, mastering the config file is basically the entire, uh, it's it's like 90% of the work of getting to grips with Jim. The config file is kind of set up uh, in JSON format. So it's it's readable in, um, in, it's very easily readable. A lot of you I know are numerical modelers, so you're probably quite familiar with these, these kind of old school um, config files that you kind of set all of your parameters to make your model run. So I'm fairly sure that a lot of you will be already quite familiar with the process of kind of iterating over models, like experimenting with different parameters um, in order to make those models um, run optimally. So there's a lot of different things in here and, um, you know, we kind of break it up into a few different areas, but the this is a single uh, config file that runs uh, all three of the scripts that you see inside your um, gym uh top level directory so there's three scripts there's there's one that does the the creation of the data set it takes your images and labels and turns them into a format that we can pass to tensorflow for efficient throughput of training in the model i'll talk about that there's the training script itself which trains the model um and then there's an, a basic implementation script that um allows you to then take your trained model and point it at a folder of images for um the purposes of actually using your model for for real purposes um outside of the scope of the of validating the model which is all done within that training script and this config file will it, it, it has the parameters for all of them um we considered kind of having separate config files but there's a lot of shared parameters so we opted on basically having one config file for all of them so the um I'm not going to step through each of these just yet because I'm going to do that on the live demo. But just know that uh, you know this is this is the config file for the test data set that you should always see. Um, you'll see a couple of things in there that won't make sense to you yet, but that's fine. We're going to step through this uh, step by step by step. Um, 
Is there a little pop up here? No, no. Okay, so I think that's probably all I want to say for the config file right now. And remember, also you can you can always chime in here. And I know that this may be a little confusing until we really get going. Um, these are just screenshots from the from the wiki. You can um, you know how this works is that you'll fir the first thing you'll do is that you'll run this uh, make nd data set. Nd uh, stands for n dimensional because we want it to be clear to folks that. This isn't even though we, a lot of the um, the examples that we use are three band images. This is actually set up to work with one band imagery, like grayscale imagery, like a sonar or a radar or something like that. Or it could be a like a single layer from like a model output or something like that. Um, or, or three band, which is kind of probably most common because that's the you know RGB visible uh, spectrum imagery. We've like personally, I've used a lot of RGB imagery. And then it's also set up to run with N band. So you can make 4D, 5D, 6D, 10D models if you if you need to. Um, and that's that situation where you have, like, for example, multispectral or hyperspectral imagery, where you've got a big stack of uh, coincident uh, rasters that have exactly the same extent and exactly the same pixel size, and they're all coincident if you uh, in the stack. So um, I'm going to run through a, a, an RGB it, uh, data set creation today, but um, I'll, when I do it, I'll talk about how you would then add additional bands. The paper that we um, that we published that actually used five bands. It used um, RGB from um, Sentinel-2 and uh, Landsat um, satellite imagery. And then it additionally, just to demonstrate, it used the near infrared and the shortwave infrared, which were pan sharpened and put on the same grid. All right. Um, next slide. Um, I thought the one of the most confusing parts of the config file, I think, is the um, setting the learning rate scheduler. So instead of using a fixed learning rate, so I, I should talk about what the learning rate is at this juncture. The learning rate essentially um, this is a this is a model optimization problem. Right. As, it, as Evan said, you train it iteratively. It sees a batch of, of images. It passes that images image through the uh, through the encoder and the decoder. Then it matches what it found uh, as the label to what you know to be the label from the training data set. And then based on that mismatch and based on the specifics of the loss function that you're using, it then uses um, back propagation to then set those weights through the model. And then it begins again. And the expectation is it's just going to get better and better and better by increments. But a very crucial part of that is what's called the learning rate. And the learning rate is essentially how much it nudges. So if you're thinking about like an optimization problem where you're trying to minimize a function, then the learning rate comes in with loss functions all the time, even if it's hidden by the by the implementation that you're using. With deep learning, the learning rate is usually um, exposed and it's specified quite clearly. Um, because it's a very important hyperparameter. It's probably the most important hyperparameter, I would say personally, in my experience, after the batch size. The batch size is like a really big lever on on how on, on kind of getting your model to work well. Um, but it's very hardware dependent because it, it, it the larger batches consume more memory. And then the next biggest lever, I think, is the learning rate. And we kind of went through quite a lot of different iterations of Jim in the early stages to see whether or not, in general, models worked best with a fixed learning rate or an adaptive learning rate where the learning rate is specified uh, based on how fast the model is, is converging to its solution. Or there's kind of maybe a more um, more new concept, which is the uh, learning rate scheduler. So the, the idea behind the learning rate is that scheduler is that you actually specify what the learning rate is for every single training epic. The, the models may not actually ever get to the end of this curve, but they certainly will usually get to the top of this curve. And the, the intuition behind this is that uh, initially, the modeler has absolutely no idea. You, you initialize it with random, completely random numbers for the initialization of the model weights. So it takes quite a bit of time for it to really figure out um, you know, exactly how much uh, to nudge that solution at every at every moment. So you, you, typically, the, the guidance is to start with a fairly small learning rate and then ramp up quickly to a, a larger one. And at that point, and so you'll see in the in the config file, there's this start learning rate, which is kind of where you're going to start here. 
you may decide to start maybe in the middle of the curve or, or, or somewhere between the middle and the bottom of that curve. This example I'm showing on the screen is we're kind of starting right way at the bottom. And then there's um, a certain um, there's a certain number of ramp up epics where you kind of, OK, that's the number of epics I'm going to. That's the steepness of that first part of the curve. Then there's the sustain epics, which is going to keep that maximum learning rate for a, a specified number of epics. And then um, then there's a ex then there's an exponential decay in that curve um, and that decay rate is set by that number I use I tend to use 0.9 and that's what's uh, specified in the in the config file so that kind of covers the the basics of that uh, learning rate scheduler it's sometimes um necessary to to change that learning rate scheduler and what we've noticed is that um usually it I, I'm kind of just changing the the minimum um and the starting learning rates more than anything else. I'm not necessarily, and I'm sometimes I'm changing the number of sustain epics as well. But oh, really? really? Yeah, sometimes, yeah. Okay, I always, I only adjust ramp up. I, I make ramp up really slow. Okay, oh. cool. <laughs> well, we learn, each, we learn things from each other all the time. Um, you know, and you develop your own intuition for what works for you and the problems that you work on. Um, probably should stop there i'll talk a little bit more about the learning rate scheduler later on but that's that's basically where you're at and, and those numbers that you see that this is just from a paper that i've written and those numbers are actually just the value of the loss fund the, the actual loss so you'll you'll you know it's really just kind of a, a pinpointing in time based on the learning rate um what those numbers are and that's i find that a helpful trick just to plot that up just because then you can see okay i very quickly went from a very high loss to a very low loss and that might be that loss and that might be where you kind of decide like evan does to to change that number of ramp ups so you can see okay well, what slope do i really need here then you'll you can you get a sense for like okay how is this sustain really necessary how much is that loss really changing as a function of me of of, of increasing that sustain and then again like you can see okay well what if you're really going to go to town on this, then obviously you'd have to do quite a lot of experimentation for all of these. But you know, you could play with that exponential decay, and you can even set um, the the number or the maximum number of um, training epics. I tend to kind of just set that at a hundred, but it very, very rarely will go out beyond the hundred. Um, and that's you know, and that's because the models tend to converge quite quickly because I've made good choices about my loss function and about my batch size and things like that because I'm experienced in doing this. You may you may kind of just set things up and things don't converge and that might be because well it could be for various reasons and we can talk about that in the q a afterwards um what else do i want to say about that oh one more thing about this so um one thing that i would like to communicate is that the learning rate and the loss function kind of go hand in hand so what we've noticed over time is that if uh, there are various loss functions that are encoded in gin that you can use Dice loss is the general recommendation for something to start with. It's much more um, suitable for problems where you don't have equal numbers of pixels of every class in your training data set. The canonical way to, to train these models that was adopted uh, early on was uh, using the categorical cross entropy um, function that is you, that is also encoded in here. But what the, the there's a big difference between those two different loss functions with respect to the learning rate. The categorical cross entropy tends to like a larger learning rate, right? So you're going to set something like um, e to the minus two or e to the minus three rather than e to the minus three, four, five for um, for dice. So the dice likes a lower number. Okay, next slide. This is the part where you're training the model. Um, some of you may be already training models, which is awesome. If you are, then hopefully you see something like this on your screen. If you're not, then you'll see it on my screen in a minute. Um, you're first prompted, and you'll see that I'll go through this live, but you're, you're first prompted. Uh, we've got a really simple kind of GUI based thing where you've, you've first say, okay, this is the data set that I want to fit to. And then the next question and the last question you'll get is, this is the config file that I want to use. It's very very much recommended to um, if you're going through a period of experimentation with models which you probably will 
uh, because it's very rare to get it perfect first time. Um, be experimental with, the, you know, take an experimental approach. Just change one thing at a time. You know, if you if you have the time to kind of step through, if you want to play with different patch sizes, for example, create a new config file for every time you you change something, and then you it's your first form of documentation, right? You can you can you can then hand that to anybody else and say this was the sequence of of things that I did. It's also crucial because when you come to actually use this model later on, it's going to ask, it's going to, it's going to actually ask you for the model weights file, but it's then going to see whether or not there's a config file that then applies to those model weights. So it's so those two things go hand in hand, and you should never change the name of the config file, and you should never move it out of the directory that you've set. And and again, I'll kind of re re, I'll, I'll go over that again. And I'll show you what that looks like on my screen because I went through this process yesterday. Um, I, I trained a few models and I'm going to show you what the different outputs were. And you'll see that I've got weights files and config files, and that's how it should be. Uh, okay, so without further ado, I guess. Um, yeah. I You should stop sharing your screen. I'm going to take a swig of coffee. Thank you um, for everyone who submitted data. Last week, um, we, as we said last week, we, you know, we're going to create this Zenodo release. Just actually, we're going to do it by the end of the week. Um, we're going to include everyone who's uh, contributed data so far. So thank you for that. Um, I think most of you have uh, emailed us and consented to that. We've got a list of your names and we'll be in touch. Um, we're going to start with um, that data set. It's actually a data set that uh it's been it, it's so you a lot of you will have um <laughs> sorry i'm skip, skipping over my words here apologies a lot of you will have labeled satellite imagery we gave you a lot of satellite imagery there's a couple of you that labeled uh other types of imagery nape imagery when we put this class together we kind of had a, a much larger class list and we made folders and we kind of split it up equally between satellite and nape uh data sets it just so happens that most of you ended up with satellite imagery. So that's the data set that we're going to fit to. There's going to be a subsequent release. There's a couple of you that uh, contributed NAPE images, and you're going to be contacted slightly later on. We're going to make another data set that includes your data. So you're not going to miss out, um, but we're going to obviously make sure that those, uh, those people who are actually labeled for this specific thing get on that release, and then there'll be another release. Um, and that is the data set that we're going to fit to today. So if I share my first screen here, um, too many screens. So this was a four for people who labeled NAEP, this was a four class data set, right? Water, white water, sand, and everything else was in an other class. That's right. Yeah. So um, I guess just step through this. So this is your this is your top level directory. So this is going to be when you see me in my screen over here, this is where I will be. I will be here on my command line prompt. I'm also going to have my Conda environment activated. My Conda environment is called Jim. If you're not set up with this Conda environment and you don't want to actually step through this, like with the test data set, then that's totally fine. You can just watch me. Uh, you do the same thing. So this is where you are. Um, it, it's very simple in how it's put together. These are the three scripts that I was talking about before. Um, this, the that's just the the um, install. That's the conda file, the conda file instructions. And then there's these utilities um, that do various things like help you troubleshoot and and various things like that. And if there's time later on, we'll step through a couple of them. Um, one of the utilities is quite useful if you're just getting started, and that's just called test GPUs. That's all that's going to do is just make sure that you have GPUs and that they work, and that your and that your TensorFlow can see them. And if you really run into trouble with GPUs, then I suggest maybe that's your first port of call. Uh, and if that still doesn't work for you, then um, I guess we'll see you on GitHub. Okay, um, this is the data set that we're talking about. So I've got, it's actually fairly complicated here because um, uh, this is the data that we all contributed last week. And then there was one more late arrival last night, um, Kyle Wright, he, he he emailed. So we've actually got two different data sets here that I've, I've kept specifically out um, um, separately because I went ahead yesterday 
um, and merge the first seven data sets. So this is an ongoing project that you're contributing to where we're trying to uh, segment satellite imagery into those four classes that, um, that Evan mentioned. Um, we're interested in where the water is, where the white water is, i.e. the surf zone where the waves are breaking. Um, we're interested where the sediment is, and then everything else is kind of just lumped into this other class. It's like no data, clouds, towns, vegetation, you name it, everything else. Um, and that's just to really simplify the problem here. If you consult the, um, this is kind of similar in scope to some of the data that we put into the Coast Train um, data set. And there's coast, there's links to the Coast Train data set from the paper. You'll see that we use the Coast Train data set. We use a slightly different version of, of some of these data for that paper. Um, one of the big differences between that paper and what I'm going to show today is that we're just working with the RGB images today because that's kind of just the most common, um, most common scenario. So long story short, I have all of these other data sets that I've already made or that other people have, have, have kind of collaborated with, with Evan and I to make. So what I ended up doing, because there wasn't necessarily enough data from just, there was 113 that we got from the, from the, um, from the class yesterday. And I decided to just then merge that with all these other data sets. So what we have then is a seven part data set where we have many, many more um, images. And Dan, I think this is a good time to just mention that what, what it's, so I've made an okay model, like enough for, to show that it would work with 20 images. And I just want to mention that for people who might want to just doodle their own things for their own problems yeah. and get there. But I think on the order of hundred to thousand is usually what I would say is the is is the number for generating a model that has some generalizability depending on the number of classes. So there's no hu single heuristic that we can provide. Now this number of classes and this size imagery, you'll need this many labeled data. But that's sort of the 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 number that I shoot for. Yeah. I don't know if you have any other comments that you want to add to that. No, absolutely. Um, Jim is totally set up. It really does depend on the problem. If you've, if you've got um, a fairly unquote unquote simpler problem where you can get away with fewer labeled images, then it will totally make a model that works well for you. That might be as low as 20 images. And then you're off, off and running, or it could be even lower than that, perhaps, but probably I'd say 20 or probably the absolute minimum. Um, and then depending on the scope of your problem, you're going to need more. So this is this is kind of a large scope problem. We're trying to find a model that will find, you know, get a model that will find water, white water, sediment and other for any image that we that might be in the world of any coastal zone. Right. So this is a fairly ambitious research project that I'm showing you. What I'm going to what I plan to do here is step, I'm just going to show you the folder and decisions that I make and the outputs that I get from this larger one. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to actually run a smaller problem so we can actually see it right, complete in a quick like go through the data set part and start the model training part while we have the Q&A. And that's just to demonstrate that, yes, you can get a good convergence on a model. Um, uh, just from a smaller data set. You'll also note that the test data set that um, that you should have, if you're playing along here, you should have downloaded and, and are, are looking at at the moment, that's only about 70 images and that's just of a single location. Generally, if you're just interested in a single environment, a single location or a single specific kind of data set, then yeah, absolutely. Just doodle a few of them and then make a gym model and see how well it works. And then at that point, you might be satisfied with what you see or you could doodle a few more and then go through that process again. Um, so it, it really does depend on the on the nature and the scope of your problem. But as I said, I'm going to go through this this um, this larger problem and show you what the outputs might be for this larger problem. I'm going to show you some loss curves. I'm going to compare them, and then I'm going to step back and um, actually do like the live demo part of this. Um, so these are the you know this is the the way that I, that you typically would set up the you have initially you just have these two folders images and labels then um and you can you know you'll see that you know there's loads of different 
sizes of images in here because I've merged lots of different data so I can just step through them. You know, you'll see that they're small because they're satellite images. They're from Sentinel and Landsat. So the pixel sizes are uh, between 10 and 15 meters. So, you know, a, a very small image actually is quite a large area. And then if you're working with uh, different resolution data, then obviously you're going to choose an appropriate size um, of image to work with. Often you're going to be working with uh, situations where you're, and ideally I would say you're going to be working with situations where the all of the images are the same size, like you've chopped up a, a larger image or you're just running with the images that, you know, maybe they're slightly downsized from the original um, or something like that. Um, as we talked about last week with Doodler, there's a, definitely a sweet spot when it comes to the image size. You're going to be working, you have a, a, a set of images that are a certain size, and then the, what the what the gym is going to do is then is going to squish them into a new size, and that's called the target size. So if we look at the config file, this is the config file from uh, these jobs. The very first line is that I usually write out is the target size because it's kind of the most it's the first decision that you'll you'll make essentially i'm running with a target size for this particular model of 512 by 512 um that is that represents because these these pixels are 10 or 15 meters that represents quite a large area but if you're in a situation where you've got really tiny pixels like you've got a drone image or you've got a numerical model output or something like that then really you have to that's on you you have to really kind of determine a what makes sense for this problem like what can you get what resolution can you get away with if you've got this really large image and you and you need to make it smaller then what can you get away with for the purposes of just labeling those pixels you'll then subsequently obviously upscale the the labels um and also like you know what it will depend crucially on like your available hardware as well the um these models are typically run on GPUs and we're not Google. So we only have like one GPU or, or a two maybe at the most. Like most of us, we don't have a very a lot of resources to buy lots of these expensive GPUs. So we're in a situation where we acknowledge that there are, the our imagery is kind of over-resolved perhaps and that we can totally get away with shrinking the images within the scope of just training the model. Remember that though, that image will then the features that that image that the uh, feature extracts uh, uses will actually, you know, within the architecture of the model, it will make a, a feature representation called a bottleneck, which is actually tiny, really, really tiny. And then it's using that to scale upwards. And it's doing a few computational tricks like skip connections and residual connections to kind of make that upscaling, um, you know, add spatial resolution back into the solution. Um, but you're still always almost always in a situation where you've got an image and then it's being shrunk and then sometimes you're even changing the aspect ratio of the pixels too and in this situation i'm i'm definitely changing the aspect ratio of the pixels because all of my input images are different sizes um but whether or not i'm shrinking the image is actually dependent on the actual data set i have purposefully it's it's kind of a it's a conscious decision that I've made through experimentation as well that I'm using imagery of different sizes because I want the model to generalize better to my problem. You'll notice that this image here of duck from Sentinel 2 it, that's you know that's much larger that's 600 by 600 pixels right so that image will get shrunk down to 512 512 but this image here, is much smaller. It's only um, 77 by 251. So that one's going to get, not only is it going to get blown up, but it's also going to change its its aspect ratio as well. Dan, Aleha is asking in the chat, and I just want to make sure everybody's aware with this. How do you figure out the target size if the images are of varying size? And I think as I'm typing this question and as you're speaking directly related to this topic, I think it's important to mention that if you are looking at a specific landform that changes in size based on the scale of the imagery you're using, hopefully you're developing a model that will be able to adjust and adapt to that sort of situation. So for example, if you're using aerial images that are from very close flights and very far away flights, 
let's say the size of the dunes in the building for coastal setting or the size of the buildings or the fields or cars or roads are going to change. But if you have enough labeled imagery, you should be able to, uh, that problem is soluble for the model and it should be able to accurately detect all of uh, the, the specific feature of interest that you've labeled. So that's, I think, the first thing that I want to mention about this. And the second is that just as Dan is saying that this target size is 512, 512, Jim only is really works with some pow powers of two target sizes work really, really well, as well as if you need rectangles, you can do something like 768 by 1024. But really, this 256, 512, 1024, these are the magic numbers for Jim because of it works for the size, the cardinality of the model as you're going through the encoder and decoder branches. Yeah, absolutely. This is, you know, this is, we're laboring this point a little bit because it's a really, really crucial point. And that's a great question, Leah. Thank you. Um, if you have, like, it really is kind of dependent on the nature of your imagery and your class set. Like you, you, we tend to using we tend to use broad classes here because we know that if we tend if we specify broad classes, then those features are not going to change. Like we're not they're not going to disappear if we change the uh, the, the image resolution or if we downscale them. The necessary kind of you know it's it's really it's just at that, that junction between how much hardware you have or is available to you and, you and 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 how much time you have to train a model obviously if you're using larger imagery it's going to take longer um because it's your computer's working harder it's got more data to actually uh, digest so at least initially i would say kind of choose broad classes that that solve your scientific problem um and choose image sizes that you can fit within that so if it means chopping if you're working with larger data sets like orthos or model outputs if it means just chopping your images up into smaller and smaller pieces to get more and more classes to see then that's what you should do but if you can get away if you've got it if like in this situation where we're using super broad classes it's really quite obvious with the thumbnail you know that that's white water and that's sand then you can do what I'm doing here. I'm going to show you though later on. I'm going to show you a completely different problem, which is uh, come from a data set called Floodnet, where it's it's very different. It, there's many many more classes. Some of those uh, are quite specific. Those are fairly small. Like the features that those classes are in the images are quite small, like cars and things like that, and big scenes. And the images are much larger. So hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a bit more of a complete sense of what we're talking about. But at least for now, um, if you just if if you need if you if your target size is large, necessarily large and you don't have a very large GPU, then you've got two options. Try to get more, more compute power or move it to the cloud or something like that. So you can actually access a larger GPU, larger in the sense of larger memory, DDR6 memory. Um, or chop the images up into smaller pieces and hope that the model uh, does well on that scale of image and that you can then piece it all together afterwards. And these are all things that we're, we're kind of grappling with every time we start a new project. I've got something like 17 different projects over the past year that has used Jim to segment images and class sets, like 17 different decisions and trials and experiments of like, okay, how what target size do I need? What batch size can I get away with? And what how good are the how how good are the model outputs for the for the specific problem that i need so it's very much if you're kind of diving into this world it's very much be prepared that you're going to go do this experimentation a little bit in order to get what you need but that said you can also run this on 20 images and at certain scale and you might be satisfied with the outputs it really does depend on your problem okay so um these are the images i've talked about the target size i for the for the reasons that i've explained above you know it's 512 by 512 is basically somewhere in the middle of the lower the, the smallest size images and the larger size images i have most of the images i have are square so most of the images are not going to be like the aspect ratio of pixels is not going to change so i'm running with 512 by 512 but as evan said if you have like you know typical format imagery then you could use something like, you know, that 7, 768, 1024, 
you can then double these numbers. You know, you could do 15, 36, and 20, 48. You like power, powers of two work pretty well for the cardinality of the of the model. There are other really specific uh, sizes that also work, but uh, we've never found, well, have we ever tried? Yeah, I think I tried. I tried and failed to find a formula that predicts what sizes work within the cardinality of the model. Hopefully someone's done that somewhere and we can find that um, at some point. Usually though, um, as I said, these these numbers tend to work pretty well. 512 by 512 is, is a typical one, 768, 1024, et cetera. Here are the number of classes that I specified. Here's the model that I want to run. There's uh, there's currently uh, quite a few different models that are built in, but the, the go-to one, the one we recommend with trying first is the res unit. Um, the residual unit, and that differs from the vanilla unit that's talked about in the, that Ronneberger 2016 paper, um, because it has these things called residual connections, which basically they take the features from the one layer and they, they literally bypass them and they add them to the next convolutional block. So the model gets to see the outputs of a specific convolution layer, and it also gets to then add them to the inputs of that convolutional layer, and it, it, it tends to make the models deeper and more robust and better generalizable. And we demonstrated that through a number of different data sets. So that's where you should start. Um, there's this weird one in there. It's called a satellite unit, which doesn't actually have any publication associated with it. And it's just a completely flat unit where it doesn't change the number of uh, filters on every, on every uh, convolutional block. The kernel size is quite important. That's the actual size of the kernel, uh, the convolution kernel that it's using to extract features. So as you pass the image in, it's doing convolutions over the whole thing. And then, you know, the size, the size of that kernel is basically then going to dictate the size of the what's called the receptive field, which is basically the window that it's using um, to, to pass over. The convolutions in it, it just the kind of the one one of the lessons from a deep learning 101 class would be that um, one of the reasons why convolution neural networks are so good on spatial problems like images is that they share weight spatially. And the there's this there's definitely a sweet spot in terms of the size of the kernel that you use and how those weights are shared across the image. It's kind of related to the state that uh, the concept of stationarity. If your image is it, it, it displays a high degree of stationarity, then uh, convolutions are going to work really well because they're going to um, exploit the fact that there is similar features in different parts of the image. Batch size is a pretty uh, important lever. As I said, you want to use, generally you want to use as large a number as you can fit on your GPU. I've got a single um, RTX 2080 Ti in my computer here. If you're a um, Linux user, you can, or, or a, you can also do this, I think, on PowerShell and Windows. I might be wrong about that. Um, but I've got this um, command that I kind of have in the background all the time. Uh, I use the Linux command watch, which basically just keeps an open pipe of a particular command. And then the command is NVIDIA SMI. And it's basically showing me what GPU I have. Um, it's also useful for troubleshooting because as we as you train models, you'll notice that the amount of memory that it, that the model is consuming is 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 updating in real time. It's showing you the temperature and things like that, and it's showing you what devices are being used um, on your GPU. Um, you know, for example, I've got my browser open, and that's consuming a little bit of memory. If you're kind of doing a model run and you're right at the edge of your memory consumption, then you want to make sure that you're closing everything that you can in order to give your GPU the best chance it has um, of, of utilizing the GPU. Oh, I'm doing a lot of talking here. I guess there's a lot of things to talk about. Um, that, that's, quite, that's, quite a thing, that's quite an important thing to know, though, if you are kind of doing a little bit of troubleshooting and you're going to be doing this a lot. Yeah, just to tell you, it's twelve fifty right now, or East Coast. It's the, at the fifty minute mark. But I just want to mention that all of these configs have all of this backstory behind them. Yeah. So if there's anyone that you specifically want to know about, let us know. But all of them have this long history of literature behind them. Yeah, and also a lot of uh, 
trial and error in terms of like what we expose and what we've can, like basically decided to not expose these when we talk about the opinionated workflow what we're really saying is that we've kind of m- taken some of the opinions away from you there are many more decisions that you could make these are the ones though that are um are going to be most crucial to the outcome that you see um so batch size is important use a high batch size if you can get away with that you know the batch size and the target size are obviously going to combine you're going to have tensors that are 512 by 512 by the n number of bands so that's three and then you're going to have labels that are going to be what's called one hot encoded so it's going to take it you're going it's going to take your integer uh 1d label that you made and it's going to then make a stack of n uh rasters and it's going to pass that to every and it's going to pass that along with the the tensors so you end up giving your gpu quite a lot of uh pixels to work with um okay and that's all i want to say about that i've obviously got four classes so that's specified there if you have many more classes then you're going to be consuming much more memory you're basically going to double the size of if you use eight classes you, you'll double the size of, of of the label tensors that you're passing to the model while it's training here's the loss function mode is a strange one just use all if you have any other unless you have a specific reason not to that just means that you're going to use both augmented and non-augmented imagery one of the things that the make data sets uh, command does is is um it creates two sets of files one is the just the just the files that you gave it essentially just um kind of pushed into the npz format archive so it can be then um, made into a tensorflow data set for a mo- more efficient throughput on your gpu um it's also going to make an augmented set and those that augmentation is is set by a whole host of parameters down here that um you should just leave uh, unless you have a kind of a, a you know a specific reason to there are things you know the, the the amount of rotation the amount of zooming in and out that you'll see that you want um shifts to the to the left or to the top um horizontal flipping vertical flipping um etc so you know the, these are basically the basics, uh, the basic augmentation parameters. There are many more, but these are the ones that it does. And this is kind of just the limit scope of of you know the experimentation that you can do because the augmentation is is really is a regularization technique. It's there to make sure that your model generalizes better, and it's very important for the most part. Um, but you could go to town on on every type of augmentation, and if you wanted to play with the augmentation then you'd you'd be in the realm of kind of modifying the script in order to do so or working with us and and we can kind of get that in there these are the um we've talked about the learning rate scheduler I'm using uh I'm using quite a lot of ramp up epics you know I'm going to have it ramp up over 40 epics sustain for five you know so it's it's going to kind of really slowly get up to its top and then kind of come back down I'm using a valid, so this is important. This is the validation split. So make data sets will um, take all of your data. Um, it's set up to be reproducibly random. So it sets up seeds, a certain seed for the NumPy and the TensorFlow operations. Um, so therefore you can run the models again and again and again, and it will always use the same training and validation files. That's important because you want to make sure if you're doing experimentation, you want to make sure that um, it's using the same files. So you know that the changes that you specified in the config was the thing that that changed the outcome, not that it saw a, a certain a, a slightly different uh, split uh, set of files on the on the training and validation. That's less and less and less important the more data you have. It's crucially important if you're working with a small data set, which I imagine a lot of you would be, at least initially. So the validation split really then is the only thing that you have in order to kind of modify the behavior of the model with respect to the training and the validation samples that it sees. The training samples are the things that actually set the model, what what it uses to determine how good the model is at every stage of training. The validation set is the thing that then determines how how the gradients should be then back propagated through the model. So if it, it when it finishes training when it finishes an epic, it will look 
to see the discrepancy between the validation set um, labels and the validation labels predicted by that current state of the model. And it will use that discrepancy to kind of nudge it one way or the other. So it's very important, but it may, but those images are not the things that the model sees during training. It's just the things that then set the model weights um, through in the back propagation. So they're both important in terms of defining the scope and the, the training of the model. My recommendation is always to use a large validation split for the purposes of generalization. You're usually in a situation where you've got image like training and validation images that is generally quite similar. Ideally, you want a, a completely independent set, a test set that is um, you know, maybe larger or, or different in scope, like it's a different place or it's a different time or something like that. If you really want to know how well your model is going to generalize um, in production. Um, but usually your training and validation sets are somewhat similar because they're the things that you labeled, right? That you can only label so much. Um, therefore, you want to keep your validation split as high as you can, I think, because or as high as you can get away with in order to see good convergence in your model. And so I typically use a split of like 0.6, or in this case, I'm using 0 0.7. 0 0.5 would be kind of equal amounts. Um, and it's not, gen I mean, you see a lot of papers that use validation splits of like less than 0.5. And I always kind of think that's quite dubious practice, um, but it does depend on the on the intended purpose. If you're just trying to segment a single data set, then that's that's fine. But if you're trying to create a model that they, you then want to give to someone else or, or apply more widely, then it's not necessarily good practice. All right. Uh, that's all I want to say for now on the um, on the on the config file. There's quite a lot here, and I know it's it's a lot to take in. It's a fire hose of information. Um, if you're not using a GPU, this is where you would set your GPU. Uh, if you're if you're using a CPU, if you don't have a G Nvidia GPU, then you set that to minus one. Minus one just means I don't have a GPU. Use a CPU instead. If you have multiple GPUs, then you can set them using commas. I've got one machine that has three GPUs and that's how I, I typically run it. It will distribute my training across three different GPUs, which is quite cool. And it's one of the things that TensorFlow Keras gives you. Um, and that's how you would do that. It's, but on this computer, we've just got one. All right, um, so I took my images and my labels. And the first thing I did actually, before I um, went down this, this process was um, I made, I used the doodler utilities. So if we go back to last week, I've got a window here that has the dash doodler um, condo environment activated. I'm inside the doodler utils. And actually I, I use the function here called gen overlays from images and labels just to make, and it, it, it kind of runs through, it asks you where the images are, asks you where the labels are. And then it generates a folder called overlays and it just shows you each each image and you can then scroll through them and see, okay, yeah, that, that's worked pretty well. I'm happy with that. And everything's lining up nicely and I'm good to go. So that's another thing that I would recommend doing uh, is to use that overlay script. Um, then I, but then, then I'm in a position where I've got what I need to run the make data sets. Um, I've specified, I've got my config file. I've got different config files in my gym project. I've made a, a new project here called gym project. And I created a folder called config and I put my config files in it. I created a, an, uh, a folder called NPZ for gym or whatever you want to call it. it might, these are my NPZ files that I'm going to use for my gym training. That's something that you need to make. Um, you kind of just need to make an empty folder to do that because you're going to specify that when you make your data set. And then the third, in, the third one I made was this folder that I called model out. It doesn't need to be called that, but an empty folder that is just going to be like where the outputs of the validation step, the evaluation step at the end is, is going to make. And I'll, I will go through each of these things as we go through, just so you're kind of oriented a bit. So I, I went through the process of, of make data sets. It first asked me, well, what folder do you want to put these in? And I said, this one. NPZ for Jim. Then it asked me, what config file do you want to use? And I said, this one. I just specified it. 
And then it said, where are your labels? And I said, here. And then it said, where are your images? And I said, here. And then the last question it asked was, are there any more images? And what that's doing is uh, it's setting you up for this kind of ND problem where you have, as I said before, you have um, maybe you have other images that are the same coincident band. Remember that it, we're set up just to use JPEGs. So JPEGs don't store um, more than three bands. So you have to kind of, it's just a little quirk of the program at the moment is that you have to store your, your separate bands as separate files. Um, and um, then you just specify which, which folders contain those files. So for example, if I had my near infrared band here, I would have the same number of near infrared bands in here and I would just put them in there. And if I had other bands like, you know, band four, oh, sorry, band five, then I would put them in there, but I don't have them in this specific example. And that's and then, from a quirk of TensorFlow that it takes JPEGs and TIFFs is still an experimental thing. So it's yeah. easier to work with JPEGs always rather than TIFFs. Yeah. Um, they, yeah, it's, and it, you know, the, and that's just because I think TensorFlow and Keras were just originally set up to kind of work with pictures of dogs and cats and, and, and things that, you know, compute vision problems, which are, which are typically just photographs of visible band stuff and it's not necessarily for geoscientists like us, but we're working on it. I think we've got plans to kind of do something better in the spring and, and you're always welcome to join us in that effort. Okay. So then it kind of just stepped through and it made, um, you'll see as as you step through it and we'll do it in a minute but i just wanted to kind of just show the outputs just in case something went wrong um it it creates a whole folder of mpz files and as i said last week you can actually open these files you, on linux you can just double click on it on windows you can open it with 7-zip or with an, another archive um view anything you can open zip folder and you'll say it's a little bit different from the doodler um ones it's it's actually it's got the array zero and array one which that is your image and your label, but it's a specific, it's, it's been, it's been sh smooshed into that target size. And then the labels have been one hot encoded. So it, instead of a, a one band image now, because I've got four classes, I've got a four, four band sparse array. So zeros and ones, and those zeros and ones just refer to where those classes are um, in the scene. So it's like a, an address. Um, then I, we're keeping track of the files. So you can always go in here and look at, okay, that's that file. That's actually a, the full path of the of the image that you gave it, right? So you can always go back and see whether or not there's problems with the files, or you can always see exactly what files actually went into the creation of your model. And then number of bands is something that it needs just internal reasons. But again, that's kind of just propagated through. And it, does that uh, does that for an augmented set? So so org, and then it also made the non augmented data non no org. It created augmented samples, and it created non augmented samples. And you know that's kind of just for the purposes of a lot of times if if things go wrong, it's it's at that make data set stage like. You haven't got your file names exactly right, or they're not JPEGs, or they're not, you know, something, or or if you're using n-band imagery, then they're not exactly coincident, or, or any number of things could go wrong. And these are just ways that help you troubleshoot, basically, and to verify that the model inputs are correct. Because I strongly you, recommend doing looking in this folder every yes, single time you every run time data set. every single time. Um, okay, so it made the data set great. And then we're in a position, uh, but what it did first actually was it resized the images. So I just want to note that the first thing it does, if your target size is different from the, the actual size of your imagery, which is often the case, then it will resize your image. It will make two new folders called resize images and resize labels. I made two different sets because I wanted to experiment a bit. I made uh, 512 uh, by 512 and I also made a 768 so I went in after it did that I went in and I renamed them so it you know so I could keep track myself of, of what it was doing um, and you can look at these you know it creates an, an internal thing but you can see how it's kind of strange right you've got these smaller images that are that are stretched wide and you've got these um, larger images 
for example, here, which look about the same. And that's okay. You know, you've determined through experimentation that that's okay. Um, really, the proof is in the pudding. The model outputs are good, but you'll see in a minute. Um, so the first thing it did is that it resized those uh, images. I always, 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 just for accountability purposes of accounting, I always just keep that classes.txt file with my images as well. Um, even though it does encode the images, it encodes them as integers, right? Like the the te the examples, the MPZ files, it doesn't know what zero means or what one means and what two means and what three means. So it's always good practice to just keep that classes still text file or make it if you need to make it. Um, then it made my model and I did yesterday, I, I took this data set and I made three different models because I had three different um, config files. I want to just spend a second here just explaining what I did in order to do that. And then we'll actually do the proper demo here and you'll see it run. Um, so the, the only different, as I said before, you just want to change one thing at a time. And the only thing I did differently between the first model run and the second model run was change the batch size. So initially I started with a batch size of 16. I looked at the model outputs. I looked at my, my over here and I noticed that it wasn't consuming all of my GPU memory. So I felt, okay, great. I can make that batch size higher. And I think my model is going to do better. And it did. Um, so the difference between these two is just that single line batch size. Again, it's just for account counting purposes and those weights are then used afterwards. And then the second thing that I did, between the, the difference between version two and version three was just, again, one thing, I changed the maximum learning rate. I went from point uh, e to the minus three to e minus four. I decided to reduce that maximum learning rate a little bit because I wanted to make sure that I wanted the model to converge slower. By reducing the learning rate, you're always going to make your model runs uh, your convergence a little slower um, for a well-posed problem anyway. And that's because it's going to nudge those weights through the back propagation steps a little less each time. Right. So I, I've also limited like by, by virtue of doing that, I've also limited the range of, of learning rates that it's using. And that's just something that I've, you know, just learned through experience of, of, of something that generally tends to, to work quite well. So I ran through this process. I basically ran make data sets once. I created that one set of MPZ files, and then I ran train model three times. First was version one config. Second was version two config. Third was version three config. And I wanted to just show you what the different loss curves were just so you can kind of, we can step through these loss curves. These are, again, these are something that you're gonna to wanna to gain a lot of familiarity with. You're gonna to want to definitely look at every time you train a model. Um, it's quite simple. On the left, you've got the um, the Jacquard index, the mean IOU score. On the left, you've got your loss. Your loss, the value of that loss is going to be entirely dependent on the loss type that you have. We've got, we're using dice here. If you had um, categorical cross-entropy, that those might start higher, like it would be a higher number typically, like two or three or four even. Um, Similarly with hinge, hinge loss, you're going to have a slightly different value. But really what you're looking at is it, all of these loss functions will ideally converge to zero, right? So you, what you're looking at um, how close they are to zero in the end is essentially what you're interested in. The other thing you're interested in is how much difference there is between the blue line and the black line. You ideally want the two lines to be on top of one another. You, if you have um, a really good model, then those two lines would be on top of one another or very similar to one another. How similar is really, that's part of the art of this. Like if there's like 0 0.05 difference between them, then that's usually okay and pretty good. If there's like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3 difference between them, then that's generally not so good. Um, but the exact threshold for what's good and bad here is it, it, it depends. Um, and you'll really get, only get a sense of what's a good model by looking at the outputs. But this is definitely something that you should start with. This is not, this is okay. It's not particularly good. Um, we can do better than this, or at least we think, we hope we can do better, right? So the validation accuracy here, you know, uh, any in the literature, they say anything over 0.5 is generally quite good for a multi-class problem because the mean IOU score is, you know, it's quite strict. It's quite, it penalizes bad pixels 
quite heavily because it's looking at each in the contribution of each individual pixel. So if you have a very small island of pixels that are that are incorrectly labeled, then that will that will reduce your score quite heavily. Um, you've probably read and been told that neural networks, A, they're a, univ a universal function approximation, right? So they will fit to absolutely anything. Um, but whether or not they generalize well is really, that's the art of this, like actually getting that validation accuracy high and that validation loss low, that's the, that's the work. It's always the work. Your training accuracies, accuracies are usually quite high. And uh, anything over 0.7 is usually really good. Like 0.8 is really, really good uh, for these multi-class problems. If you've got a binary problem of just like, for example, water or no water, then your expectation shifts up a bit. Anything over 0.8 or 0.9 is generally quite quite considered better. But the more classes you have, generally you'll see your mean IOU score come down a bit. So if you've got 30 classes, then the mean IOU score of 0.6 is, is quite good. And you'll notice that with it when in your when you see the outputs, it really just does depend a little bit on the number of classes that you have. So it's not a perfect metric for for sure, and there are better metrics. I'll talk about metrics in a, in a second because we spit out many more metrics than just this. But this is kind of your very quick overview of what of of what went down in your model. There's a number of things that you can glean from this curve. You know, you'll see that it's jumping up and down quite a bit with my validation. It's not too bad, but like generally, you know, it's it's much less smooth. And that kind of speaks to my low batch size, I think. You know, I've got a fairly low batch size for the for the size of imagery that I have. The 16 is kind of middle of the road kind of batch size. If you can go higher, and that's what I ended up doing. Um, and you'll see that it bounced around quite a bit because then the batches themselves are small, therefore the variability um within the batch is just as great you know it's great compared to the variability outside the batch and you'll see that also reflected these are kind of just mirror one another often oftentimes if you see really big spikes in your loss curves it means you've got you've probably got a bad data you've got like a couple of bad images in there that the model's thinking huh i've not seen anything like that before and that causes it to spike and so if you have that spike then Definitely look at your overlays. Definitely look at those augmented and those uh, and those non-augmented samples, and you can weed out the bad data points because it, it happens. We're not all perfect labelers all the time, and we make errors. You know, just basic errors when we're kind of wrangling our data sets together, converting between different image formats and renaming images and all that kind of stuff. That's kind of where errors come in. All right, so that was my first model run. This was my second round. The difference be between them was that it had a, a slightly larger batch size. You can see that the model converged um, slower. There's slightly less variability in my, you know, in terms of big jumps between one epic to the next. There's maybe slightly less variability because by virtue of that batch size, you can see that the mean IOU score is higher for both. Yeah, these aren't scaled the same. So you'll see that, you know, look at this 0. 0.6, for example, here. We can go over here and see, okay, well, we cleared that this time. And here we've cleared 0. 0.8 on our training. So that's a better model. It's better because of, of all of those reasons. And then the last thing I did, when I looked at that, I thought, okay, well, there's a, there was a number of things I could have changed here. I was tempted to change the ramp up. You know, I, had, I specified quite a very, uh, quite a large ramp up um, not 40, if you remember, and sustain a five. If I was to do this again, I'd probably lower those, but um, you'll see that, you know, I had a number of different things that I could have changed there, but I just wanted to see what the effects of doing one thing was, and that was to change the maximum learning rate. And you can see that by changing the maximum learning rate, it didn't do much at all, right? So here I'm in this situation where I'm, okay, I'm, I'm like, okay, back to the drawing board. This isn't, this has actually made it worse. I've got, you know, it ended, ended up, this is the model that worked the best because the stats are the best. Um, and then by changing that maximum learning rate, I actually made the model worse. So I don't want to go in that direction anymore. I want to go in the opposite direction, maybe, or I want to change something else. And, uh, you know, I wanted to kind of just give you a really honest, like, this is this process that I go through in order to try to get arrive at the best model, because this is honestly, this is kind of similar to what you will go through too. But what you change and when and why will, will change depending on your your reading of these curves and what you see in these outputs. 
before I take a look at these, I want to make make you aware of what you know it creates um, when it when it finally finishes the model training, it takes the validation set and it applies the model to each image in the validation set, and you get a whole bunch of different metrics per image. And then that's in, and it create and it's it stuffs them into a CSV file. And that's quite informative. Oh, it's quite informative um, to look at that because you can kind of just get a sense of you can make distributions of this and just get a sense of okay do i have a really large distribution of values here and then it's up to you you, know, you can these are different metrics that you can use they they quantify slightly different things um uh, about the nature of the problem like the matthews correlation coefficient you'll generally get higher scores um frequency weighted iou that's more appropriate than uh, it can be more appropriate than mean IOU if you have a situation of very large class imbalance. Um, so I'm going to leave it up to you in the interest of time to look up what that what these mean. But I just want you to know that they're available to you. And then also you can look at you know each each class you can actually get um, a score. And there's quite a lot of information in here. You know each one of the samples you and each one of the classes has uh, precision recall and f1 scores and you can then use them um, when you're reporting out your stats or when you're troubleshooting and then it's often good to just look at individual outputs you know like these are you, you'll see that it creates two different outputs it actually goes through and it, it looks at you know how good it, the image was on the training sample this is a, is a nice one this worked really well has a high dice score has a low uh, callback leebler distance those things are talked about in the paper. I don't have too much time to talk about them right now, but these are other metrics that are useful outside of uh, the mean IOU. Um, this is a nice one, but it's on the. You'll see that it's on the training data set. So you know, your the expectation is it's going to do better on the training than the validation. So you should scroll down to you know a, a similar one. This is an augmented validation sample, and you can see that it's it's done pretty well. This was a sample that the model never saw when it was uh, during training, but it saw enough similar things to make a good call in this in this decision, uh, in this situation. So you can see that in general, you can easily see that this model has done fairly well. Whether or not it's good enough for my purposes is really going to then depend on what I do with this next, right? Like, you know, this is the this is an intermediate step. This is as far as we can take you with Jim, but I, I wanted to say that obviously. You're all scientists, and you're trying to get at science. You're trying to use this tool to get at scientific, um, you know, testing hypotheses and generating new data, data layers, and things like that. So, in the end, whether or not this output, which looks quite good, whether or not it's actually good enough, that's going to depend on your intended purpose. And obviously, that's something that we can't help you with. But you know, it's 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 probably worth mentioning. But I'm fairly happy with this model, um, so I went ahead. I, I decided that this was the best model, um, but I've got three models. And the next and final part of the process here was using that um, seg images in folder script. Uh, if you remember before we had the seg images in folder, this is gonna ask you first, uh, where are the images that you want to segment? So you tell it where those images are. I've got, I made this folder inside my gym project. I made this folder and I put a bunch of images in there um, that I was interested in segmenting. These are images that never were labeled. Obviously, you're going to have way more unlabeled uh, data than you have labeled data. So these are the images that were never labeled. Um, and I went ahead and created. Uh, so you pointed at that, and then you you tell it where the weights are. So if you remember, uh, the way that you've set this up is that your config and your weights uh, it's going to create a weights file for every one that you did. Inside that weights, inside that weights directory, is a few different things. Um, for each model run, you'll actually get five files. The um, the first file, this MPZ file, this contains all of the metrics. So these are all of the things that you see inside that CSV file and what you see plotted in those loss curves. And you can do what you like with that. Um, and it's split it out. Um, you know, that's the loss curve, the learning rate curve that you use, everything. It's entirely reproducible. That's the entire point. We've tried to make it easy for you to really, rip, as scientists, report all of this out, to hand it to someone else for scrutiny, um, and et cetera, et cetera. 
So it's it, all of that information is inside the MPZ file. We haven't written utilities for that because we expect you to, to be able, you know, it's, your intended use case for that is going to be completely different every time. Um, but these are quite useful. These are the actual validation files that it used. And again, remember, these are the MPZ files, but remember each one of those MPZ files has that file name inside it. So you can easily reconstruct like exactly what images went into um, uh, the, the training and the validation. And, you know, you can see that there's a lot of augmented files in there. Um, and then the training files similarly. And then finally, we've got these two different sets of model weights. You can give the seg images in folder script, you can give it either set of weights. Um, but the full model weights, that's the that's the situation where you can give that uh, to someone else who has a, a different computer architecture to you. So, you know, you'll notice that like there's, it actually puts not just the weights of the image, but also the, the architecture of the model inside it too. So that's something you can give someone else. And that's why there's two different sizes there. In general, I would recommend just using running with the full model weights. Like, you know, think of this one as like, that's the internal thing that it was using when it was training. And then this one contains more information that you can then lo like load up um, in, in different contexts outside of Jim. There is a third way as well um, that, oh, maybe I won't talk about that because we don't actually encode it in Jim yet, but there is a third way to create these models. And it would be a simple matter of kind of just uh, taking this model and then the architecture and then saving it out to a different format that is even more portable between um, different devices. But That's in Jim and the utilities. Oh, it is? Okay, great. Yeah, it is. It's it's called generate save model. Oh, that's right. And I'll cool. just say that I don't use the H5 files at all. I use, I use that generate save model and that's the most portable function. The reason why that exists is because the loss dice loss is a custom loss function. We wrote dice loss. And so you can't pass that up to a person. If you make a model with dice loss, you can't pass it to somebody and they can reconstitute it at all give an error and say the loss function needs to be defined. And this version save model actually replaces it with a built-in loss function. So that makes it ultra portable. Sweet. All right, so that's in the utilities there. So you've got your, the different things here. Uh, we don't have time to talk about all of these utilities, but they are documented or at least in the stages of being documented on, on the wiki. Um, I think we've done a fairly good job of documenting them on the wiki. Um, okay, so I then pointed, so I took the, the weights file, I pointed it, it ran through each image, and it creates this folder called out, simply out. You know, it's up to you to rename it to whatever you think is appropriate. Uh, even though the best model was V2, I went to look at the V, the V3 model. And then for each one of the uh, input images, it creates um, three different files. One is the overlay file, which is kind of easy to look at, right? That's, you've got the image on the left and then the output as a trans, semi-transparent overlay on the on the right. Um, it creates um, the colored label too. That's not necessarily something that you always need, but that could be useful for, for subsequent processes. Like you're gonna kind of map, use it for mapping and things like that. And we'll, we can talk about that right at the end. And then it creates this NPZ file. And this is kind of everything that it did this is kind of storing all of the different information that it did uh, use in or extracted um, during the model uh, prediction step. So for example, it gives you the softmax scores. The softmax scores are these kind of pseudo probabilities of every class, of every pixel. Um, it's the thing that we then take to determine what class each pixel is. Typically, we would just use um, the argmax, fun argmax function. So it's going to take the maximum softmax score in the stack and then say, OK, that was the maximum, so I'm going to call it this class. Um, it, you know, it, it encodes things that might be useful downstream, like there's the grayscale label, for example, that you may want to use. As a, These are all NumPy arrays, right? So you can just read these straight into a Python script really easily. And there's a whole bunch of other metadata things in there that uh, like that's the config file that you use, right? So that's important too. If you ever lose that config file or modify it, then you can come back to this and, and it's and it's written out. Um, oh no, sorry, no, that's not right. They're, they're the actual config files that you use. So don't ever lose the config file. 
um, you always need that config file. It should also, it should always stay with your weights, as I said before. But it has some of the different things in there, like the number of classes, the number of bands and stuff. There are a couple of different decisions that you need to make when um, when using that script. Um, they're all there at the bottom. There's three of them. Um, the simplest one to explain, oh, so write mo model metadata is true. That creates this MPZ file. If you say false, then it's not going to create that MPZ file. And that's just for situations where you might have like limited storage or something like that. But generally, you want to keep that true. Um, there is an option instead of using the argmax function, which will just determine what the biggest, you know, uh, what's the best softmax score for every pixel. You can use an adaptive threshold, um, but that's only for binary problems, right? So binary problems like two class problems, yes, no problems. That will use point like your arg match will be is it below or above like 0.5, but you can sometimes your distribution of values are skewed one way or the other, and it might be more appropriate to use an adaptive threshold. So it's actually determining what that threshold is for every single image, and it might not be 0.5, it might be 0.4 or 0.6. That's what the Otsu method gets you, and that's why it's called the Otsu threshold. And then finally, there's this thing that's a little harder to explain, which is uh, something that's called test time augmentation. This applies to both binary and multi-class problems like we have. And what that's really doing is it's basically, it's taking the image and instead of just providing one output for every image, it's providing multiple outputs for every image. And it's doing that just by uh, doing literally augmentation on the input image. So you give it a sample image, it will uh, predict on that, and then it will flip it horizontally, give you that, flip it vertically, give you that, and then, you know, and like, do different transformations on the image and then untransform the resulting labels. So you get then a stack of labels that you can then average. That's all that's doing. Um, but it can be quite a powerful thing. It just deter it just depends. I typically set it to false unless I know that I need it. And, and whether or not I need it is just determined experimentally. Evan's going to talk a little, uh, a little bit about in the end about segmentation zoo and what we're doing there in order to make some of these decisions a little bit easier to follow, um, a little bit easier to construct your custom solution for your own you know, implementation. I will say though that you know, once the model is trained, that's not the end of the work. You still need to kind of decide how best to use that model on your, on your data. And that's what, we're, that's what we're talking about here, like these, these simple decisions about how to, how to use that model and how to best optimize um, the model outputs. Um, and then finally, I wanted to say that the pre pred Im seg images in folder script, it allows you to give it multiple weights as well. So when you um, when you run the script, the first thing it asks you again is the where's the images? The second thing is where's the weights? And then it will say, are there any more weights? Like, do you want to add any more weights? And what it's asking you there is, do you want to run the model in like ensemble mode? Do you want to provide multiple models and then get an ensemble model output? And so um, I wanted to do that too. And that's what I did here. And I, you know, I looked at the outputs and they're very similar for this particular example, but there's definitely situations where you get a much better prediction. Uh, if you do that, uh, your models are generally, you know, they, they have to have the same target size, but other than that, they could be constructed in different ways, like with different loss functions or with different whatever, batch sizes or whatever. Um, and so, there are slightly different realization of that model, and you just oversample. You're basically using this as an oversampling exercise. You're just kind of using these models again and again and again, and then averaging the outputs in the hope that you get a more stable outcome. Um, oh my God, it's ten thirty already. I've been talking for a long time, haven't I? I guess this was a large thing. Um, do we want to go through this like live demo thing, or is, have I kind of conveyed sufficient information here to? You know, because I've I've talked to. I think process. the helpful thing is for people to actually see you run the command line. Okay. So that people understand what it looks like and what to feel comfortable with. Okay. Both of them don't need to be like it. We don't need to go through and fully train it, but I think it's really helpful to see the windows. Pop up. Okay, so maybe I should do that on just on a smaller data set then, right? Because I'm gonna want. Um, few images. Maybe I'll just do that. Okay. So I'm here in segmentation gym. The first thing I'm going to do is make ND data set. 
it's going to ask me where I want to put my output files. I'm going to navigate to the directory. And I'm just going to run with this data set six, which is a smaller version of the date. Oh, sorry, no, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> I'm going to run. Yeah, I'm going to run to my gym project. This is my MPZ for gym, and I'll just dump them in there for now. I can tidy them up afterwards if I need to. So I'll say OK. Then I'll select my config file, which is just usually the next level directory up, so you don't have to navigate too far. I'm going to run with this same one that I did before because it has a it has all of the same settings like the target size that I want, etc. Then I'm going to navigate to um, my my labels. So I typically, as you see here, I've got like I've got a folder that is that is called the name of my project, and that contains all of my labels. And then it contains a, a subfolder that has all of the gym stuff inside it. And I just do that as much as my personal preference. Um, just to make sure that I can keep track of where all of these, these things that relate to one another. So the first thing I'm going to do is label files. I'd say label files first because they're more important in many respects. And then um, I'm going to navigate to my images. And here's where it says you have more directories of images. As I said earlier, that's kind of pertaining to this uh, situation where you might have other grayscale bands that are the same. In this situation, I don't. It says, it, so your first clue as to whether this is going to work is that, OK, you found the same number of images and labels. It use, Internally, it's using this, uh, it's, it's sorting those files, right? So it, it's making sure that the images and the labels are um, related to one another. You should always make sure, of course, that your image and your label are named the same thing because that's how it's gonna that's how you know for sure that it's actually gonna find but they oh but it's the root of the image can be slight the, the full name can be slightly different but as long as they have the same start so you'll notice here that you know that first image is the date the sensor the band the id of the person who labeled it and then label it doesn't have to have that label at the end, but it's just for my own purposes that I want to I want to do that. But as long as it has like the the same root, then it will find it. It uses this algorithm. The sorting algorithm it uses is called nat sort. So it's um, it's it uses natural sorting of the images, which is important because we're all used to different conventions for naming files, and nat sort is the most general way that it will sort the the, the files alpha numerically so you know here it's it's kind of issued a bunch of instructions and that's quite common it will basically say that um oh sometimes tensorflow can can be compiled in different ways or it has different instructions and, and compiler flags that it's not used or whatever for the most part that doesn't matter if you really wanted to troubleshoot that then it gives you the information that you need to but it's just a warning it's nothing that you really need to pay too close attention to one thing that I always like to see written up on screen is that it's actually using the correct GPU that I specified. The, the GPUs are kind of just specified as, as number. If you have more than one, then you'll have zero, one. Uh, but typically, you're just using zero. The device is the PCI ID number is zero. Um, it's going through that. It may it already it resized the files. It made um, the Aug the non-augmented version of the files and what it's doing right now is making the augmented version of the files. Um, the reason why it's it, so it has this little weight bar and the reason why it's like one of five is because inside the config file I asked it for five copies of the data. So what that's what that means is that I'm going to get five versions of every single image and label pair. So it's going to flip it horizontally or randomly. It's going to it's going to apply a random um augmentation transformation based on these parameters here and it's going to make five copies of them you could just have two if you want one or you could have 50 if you needed it um that's up to you typically five is is good um but that's again that's one of the little levers that you can uh, pull here that's part and of can we look at watch nvidia dash smi oh yeah good call and top or or, or h top if you have 
Sure. Um, so here, this is the NVIDIA SMI. You can see that I'm not using all of my memory here, but it's using the memory. You can see that Python, this Python script that I'm running um, is using, you know, close to 10 gigabytes of memory. Uh, top, yeah, I can do top. HTOP um, is, do you have HTOP installed? I'm not sure if I do. I know, no, I don't on this. Um, I can install it, but it's going to give me the same rough information, right? So I can see here that it's using, um, oh, look, Zoom is using most of my CPU. Python is using the second uh, amount of CPU here. And you can see that it's it's quite well optimized. It's using very little CPU memory here. Anything else you want to talk about here, Evan? No, I, I just think that those are the two things that I often use when I'm running a model just to see that everything's working appropriately. HTOP to look at the cores, how many cores are being used and uh, right. the utilization and the GPU utilization with NVIDIA SMI. Yeah, I would have to do uh, a little installation to do HTOP. Oh, I did my password wrong. <laughs> <laughs> so while that's doing that, I'll go back to um, just see, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'll go back to here where I specified I wanted my model out. You know, it's just, it's, you've seen this already. It's just making the, the files. We can have a look at some samples. You'll see that, you know, they're very similar. This is, this is just a subset of the data. Um, here we can now do HTOP. And this is what Evan was saying. We've got at the top here, we've got each core. I've got a lot of, I've got 24 cores on here. And you can see that they're barely being used, but all of them are being used. It's, it's highly parallelized. And that's what you want to look at. All right, but you may not be a Linux user, so that might not be available to you. I'm not sure. I'm not a Mac guy. I don't know. I'm sure most of this is available on Mac too. I just don't know. Um, NVIDIA SMI is available on every platform, as far as I'm aware. And then you can see it's done. So it's you know it's not it's just using a baseline amount of memory here, which is just keeping my Firefox and my Zoom open. Um, okay, so now I've made the, the data sets, it's done everything it needs to do. The next thing I do is train model. And it's going to ask me for that directory of data files that I'm going to navigate to. And that was in Jim project, NPZ. Sorry, if I'm going a little fast here, that we've only got 20 minutes and left the class. And then here it's asking for that config file, um, which is here. And off it goes. So it uh, prints out a couple of different numbers, which is just, um, that's like the number of test samples and validation samples, creates and compiles the model. Again, some, like sometimes you get these error messages. They're just warnings, though. Um, like that there is just saying, I loaded CUDA DNN, right? Great. We don't need to know that. Um, but this thing here, for example, this is kind of really specific, like chipset stuff where you're kind of like, you might have like a particular chipset, like an Intel chipset. If you really want it to go through that, it doesn't, it doesn't seem to impact performance. Here it's, um, it's stepping through. So we're on the first epic training epic The it has 165 steps, uh, training steps. So here that's 165 training steps and it will have a hundred, uh, 15 validation steps, I think. Um, and each step is just a batch. So it will go for each epic, we'll see all of the data, but it, break it breaks it up into what's called mini batches. So it will just feed in 60 or 20, whatever I've specified in my config file, just feed in that many um, at a time. And it, each time it's passing through forward, passing backwards, and then off it goes. It just goes back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. Um, and then it compiles all of that information and it kind of does the validation step. And uh, so it accumulates all of that information. And this is why TensorFlow is kind of sophisticated and awesome is that it really helps. It takes all of the work out of training models like this efficiently because it's making sure that there's always enough imagery that's getting passed to my GPU. If we go over to my NVIDIA SMI, you can see that it's using a good amount again of my of my GPU, 
It's making sure that I'm not using too much or too little. It's giving the operating, it's leaving a little bit in, in room for the operating system so I can actually make this call. But you might notice that my video slowed down a bit because it's using my GPU and I've just got one on this machine. Um, but it's making sure it's kind of communicating with the operating system continuously to make sure that nothing's going to like break too badly. Um, Don't worry if it gets hot because I think ADC is when it starts to throttle the GPU. But you yeah, could cook, you could cook eggs if you wanted to in your computer. Right. So, you know, this like I, I look at the fan and if that's really, really, really high, then, you know, it's kind of really working quite hard. Um, what's more important is to look at this number here. And you'll notice that. So during the training step, so if I go back to here, so it's on the validation step at the moment, it's using slightly less of the GPU, but during the and it's and you know it's on the validation step because it's paused right it's it's stopped updating the training ethics and it's just now stepping through the validation sample which remember is 70 percent of the data and now it's on epic three and so you'll go back here and you'll see that this number should climb back up to 100. so what that means is that we've done our job correctly well mostly correctly in that it's it's making sure that the utilization of your GPU is is maximized. The only reason why it's dipping below 100 actually is because I'm on this Zoom call. If I wasn't on the Zoom call, that would be pegged at 100. But it's just it's periodically communicating with the operating system to make sure that these other process IDs have enough memory. Um, I want to mention that the when you look when you see these batches being passed through, there are some great information that you can yes. use to debug first of all it's the the loss in this case if you've set it to dice loss that's just the one minus the dice coefficient so you can just look at the add the dice coefficient and the loss together to make sure that those are one if they're not you know something is a little bit messed up usually it's just some incorrect thing with your how you've uh your labels and your images so it's a good indication that you should go back and look at those AUG and no AUG samples. The dice should also be above the mean IOU. That's another example. And you should actually have numbers and not NANs. If you have a NAN, an NAN appear for dice or mean IOU or loss, you know that something has gone awry usually with the data. And there's other more sophisticated things that have gone wrong if, the, if, you're, if, we, if your data is verified to be correct. And that has to do with some of the opinionated stuff that we've done, specifically that the model itself is using mixed precision to train. It's not using 32-bit floating point integers for the 32-bit floating point numbers for the entire, um, all the all the weights and biases in the model. It's using uh, reduced precision, so 16-bit precision. So sometimes there can be underflow or overflow problems that occur and you can that results in NAN loss. So if that occurs, just stop and let us know. You can do that via Git. Get, Dan, can you open up the actual printed out um, model, uh, the Keras plot model figure? This thing? Yeah, isn't, can you? Isn't the plot, does the plot model still get rendered, not the summary? Oh, I I, I haven't installed, this is a new machine and I haven't installed it. Oh, okay. Um, but, I, but I've got an example of that, um, though. I, I made sure I had an example of that. Where did I put it? Um, oh, God. Now you're trialing me here. Like, there's something like this. Yeah. This is an example of you need to look at the architecture of what your model looks like. The train script will also export this. Typically, if you have it installed, if you have the, the pieces installed, the, the Conda environment should install it. But this is a great example of what the actual model is, what the model looks like. So if you want to look at the model at the same time that it's operating, you can see it. Or sort of if you need a figure for a paper or something like that. This is one of the outputs from the train file. Yeah, and in our gym paper, we actually modified this output and we kind of just flipped it on its side and we color coded the different layers. And that's really, it's just the modification of this. And this is like, this is, when we talk about residual connections, then there's one here, there's one here. These little inner loops, they're the residual connections. And then these bigger, these bigger arrows, they're what's called skip connections. So the difference between the vanilla unit and the residual unit is that the vanilla unit has these skip connections, which preserve spatial resolution between the encoder and the decoder layer. Um, 
but the the residual connections are absent from the vanilla one and there's basically this it's it, you see the add functions this is what i was talking about earlier about it's kind of it's branching off in two different ways and it's then combining that information cleverly cleverly these are the <laughs> sorts of time wasting activities that i tend to do when the model is running because you sort of want to flip back after a few epochs and look at the and just go down the list and say, okay, the mean IOU is increasing, the dice is increasing, the loss is decreasing. And it's the same for the validation loss, the validation IOU, and the validation dice. These are just the indicators. So it's nice to stick around for one, 10, one to 10 epochs to make sure everything is moving in the right direction. Yeah. Um you know, and you could kind of stare at these quite a lot. You know, there's so much information in this screen that you can spend quite a lot of time when you're first running the model before you step away and go play guitar or make a cup of tea um, <laughs> or whatever you got to do, answer emails. You know, you can see here, like my validation, uh, I'm looking at my validation dice and I'm comparing that to my training dice. And I can see that, you know, I, you know, as expected, my my training dice is a little higher, but it's not horrible. My validation loss is not horrible. The, the dice coefficient is going up, the loss is going down, and the losses are comparable. Um, and these are all things that you kind of want to make sure that are working. You know, obviously, you want to make sure that they're not NANs and things like that as well. Um, as to how long this is going to train for, I could not tell you because I'm not trained on the specific data set, but um, it could it's not going to, I can tell you now, it's not going to take a hundred epics. Um, it will probably be done you know, after a little bit amount of time. We've got 12 minutes left of our class and, um, I should probably do, do you want to step through that seg images and folder script, or should we now transition to talking about the rest of the, the Zooniverse or the Doodleverse? I mean, we've got we've got this as we mentioned before. We've got this other thing that's called segmentation zoo, and that has these implementation scripts. Evan, did did you do you think it's worth taking a bit of time to talk about that, or do, should we open the floor for questions at this time? I think we should do questions. I link to that one. The one the most basic notebook in Zoo is linked in the chat. That shows you what it's like to open up a model and send one image through. I think it's interesting just to understand how to send one image through and what the results are of sending one image through and the steps you need to make. And that's for if you want to do something outside of seg images and folder. So that that's linked. I'm happy to go over it, but I think it would be more helpful if we just had it open for questions. Okay, it sounds good. So I've lost my questions because I can't actually see. It's, when I go into sharing mode, I think every other window on Zoom disappears. So yeah, you can stop if you want. Should I stop sharing? Okay. There are no questions right now, but if anybody has any. And I don't think we have the wrap up slide was really just to say thanks everybody for participating. And if you want to, please reach out on GitHub to let us know um, if there are any issues at all. And if you'd like to participate in the spring, we'll probably do some sort of hackathon or sprint to get some of the some things that we want done in the Doodleverse. And it'd be awesome to have more participants. So the, have any specific. Yeah. Um, so please, if you have questions at this moment, I, mean, the, I know there's a lot of information that we imparted. A lot of that is duplicated on the wiki. You know, most of the things that I've said today and Evan said today are reproduced in that wiki. Um, so we understand that, that you don't have questions right now, but you might have questions later once you've actually had a bit of time to digest this and if you've actually run through this. But I'd be interested to hear if anyone's actually been able to run on the test, like if anyone's actually got to the point where they've made their condo environment and that they've run on either their own data set or on the test data set. And if you've encountered any problems or if you have any questions at this time, um, now would be a good time to do it. If we've still got 10 minutes left of the class or any other questions you might have.
Uh, so Stephen asks, what might be the issue if the ensemble model looks to put out an almost identical output as a single model prediction? Um, I mean, the short answer would be that your models are very similar. They're providing very similar results. There may be some details in there, though, like depending on exactly how you ensembled your data, uh, sorry, your model outputs. I think the way that it's set up in the script is that it takes, so each model will provide a separate so set of softmax scores. And I think what it's just a very simple implementation where it takes all of those softmax scores and then just averages them. And then it does the argmax. So if you get a very similar output, that probably just means that um, the average softmax score over all of your models was very similar to any individual model, which speaks to those models being very similar themselves. But it will depend. Yeah, of course. Anyone else got a question? And you can unmute if you don't feel like typing. Okay, good seeing you, Julie. Sniffer. Yeah, thanks. This was good, guys. All right, catch you later. Yep. Uh, can we briefly explain, explain Sniffer? So Sniffer is not directly related to Jim. Sniffer was uh, is a program that's uh, been developed by Sharon Fitzpatrick, who's on the call here. Um, I'll I'll allow you, Sharon, to explain what Sniffer is if you like. But if you don't want to, then I will explain. All right, I will explain. the um, The purpose of Sniffer is to it's called sniffer because it sniffs out the bad images in your data set that's the original intention of it uh, we wanted a program that we wanted to be able to basically uh, categorize imagery um that good or bad images so for example with, with this particular model that we run today you'll probably notice that if you're familiar with satellite imagery you'll probably notice that quite a lot of those satellite images were quite good right they were crisp and clean and they didn't have clouds and weird artifacts in them, which is quite common for satellite imagery. So we've used Sniffer, for example, to manually, like it's a it's a web interface that you load your images into and then you click a button that says, yes, no, good, bad, good, bad. It's recently been modified um, to uh, have a kind of a, a Linkert scale where you can grade the how good or bad, like, like one to five or something like that. But it's basically, it's just a, it's just a small utility that um, we've developed for the purposes of kind of classifying whole images. Yeah, no worries. Um, so when tuning the models, do you typically have a yeah. workflow for that? Um, we Yes, we've briefly touched on quite a few of those um, decisions that you could make in a config file. I'm sure my workflow is a little different from Evan, so I'm going to say mine and then I'll let Evan um, speak to that. So the uh, first thing I do is obviously I'm going to decide what target size I have because that's going to be dependent on the amount of memory that I have in my GPU essentially. So you know, that's the very first decision that I make. That goes hand in hand with the batch size. I'm going to play around with different batch sizes until I've got a the the, the biggest batch size for the target size that I can fit on my GPU. Um, if I really know that I am going to need a much larger batch size, then I'll have to use a different computer or, or you know, that has multiple GPUs or whatever. But for the most part, that's not the reality. The next thing, um, so I'm going to train a model. The next thing I'll probably do is then look at those outputs and decide, um, you know, what configuration thing I, I can change easily that's going to make the biggest amount of difference. And those two things are going to be either the loss function or the learning rate. Um, the loss function is the easiest thing to do because you just have to specify like something else, like KLD or hinge or whatever. You can look up all the, you know, we can, we can, we've documented some of these loss functions and you can look them up. They're just standard Keras uh, loss functions. Um, but that's going to make a huge amount of difference. Then the learning rate, I would say, would be the next thing where we talked about, like, you know, modifying that curve. So it's using different starts and different ramps. 
Then I would say if, if you're kind of still in the process of like troubleshooting the model, then I would say the next thing that I would tend to go to would be the kernel size. Um, you know, we tend to use a fairly large kernel size. Um, like I typically would use like a kernel size of seven or nine. That's a little larger than you see uh, typically written out in machine learning papers that use UNETs. Um, and I think it, it, the intuition that I have over it, and it's talked about in the paper a little bit, I think, is that we've got um, we've got spatial data. So Tobler's law applies, you know, things that, that we've got spatial autocorrelation in the imagery. We've got this, we're thinking about this concept of image stationarity where different parts of the scene look um, similar to one another. That means that, like, for example, if you have a picture of a dog against a background of grass, then you've got a specific object in the image that you're trying to trying to capture, right? So there's less stationarity in that image than there would be in a, in a spatial scene of like water or landscapes, right? Where you you can choose a corner of the image and it might be it might be similar to another one. Um, then, if you're still not getting good model results, then I would then turn to regularization regularization things like dropout. One of the things that we didn't talk about was the dropout. But there are many things that you could do with the dropout. Um, you can change the amount of dropout. You can change how much that changes for every layer. You can change the type of dropout. You can specify whether there's dropout on the on the encoder or the decoder. That's all the model things that that I would send to do. But really, what I really do is I do the first couple of things. I'll look at the batch size, I'll look at the learning rate, and then and the dice function. And then if I'm not if if I'm not seeing improvement, actually I'll go back to the data. And really it's the data, I think, for many cases that is going to make your models better. You can quite easily get to the point, and this is the beauty of Jim, I think, is that you can do this experimentation so quickly that you know, in a single day, you can have loads of different models and you can really reassure yourself that you can't do that many more tweaks on your model. So my advice is to go back, make better data, make more data, include more data and troubleshoot the data if it needs troubleshooting. Over to you, Evan. Yeah, I uh, don't do any of that in that order. The thing that I do is I make the batch as large as possible first. Like I try to break the GPU. So 16 or 24 is the batch. And once I've done that, I might change the, um, the, I'm looking through these now. I might change the kernel and make it larger, but seven is, I like prime numbers. It works really well. Um, I, I change the patience to be larger, make the patience 20 or 30. So that's how long we'll run the model, even with low learning rate, to make sure there's a little bit of a decay that you can squeeze more efficiency out of the model or more uh, success out of the model or optimization. Then I change the ramp up also to a little bit higher so that it takes longer to warm up. And then I switch immediately to augmentations and I try to over augment. Again, I'm trying to break the model by over augmenting it. So there's a sweet spot with augmentation where if you are under augmenting, there's more to there's your model could get better. If you're over augmenting, your model is getting worse. And so there's some sweet spot with augmentation. So I do that. And then um, I don't do anything else. And I just label more data. Like it's always it's, for me, it's I'm always at the limit of under uh, of, of low data problems. Yeah, me too. So always, always like for me, it's just biggest batch biggest augmentation and then go to go back to the data the secret here and why i wanted to say that zoo notebook is helpful is if you look at it then you can actually look at the probabilities uh for each class the softmax scores or you want to look at the outputs and say what is misclassified here what is done incorrectly and those are the images not those specific images but you want to find more images that are like that that have that hallmark color and pattern on the RGB images and doodle those. So you're in this virtuous cycle of seeing where the model is failing and then trying to correct that failure and then going back to making models. And I think that that sort of virtuous active learning style loop is what you quickly want to get into. So the goal always with low data is to try to break the model yeah, and see advice. where the breakages are occurring. Yeah, good advice for sure. 
Um, and I'm always in a low data environment too. Like I, I know, I just know by intuition and experience that I always need more data. And so if I'm on a boring Zoom call or if I'm stuck in front of the TV or something, I've got Doodler on, you know, I'm making more data because that's what I know I need to do. All right, we have passed the um, passed the hour here and there's people signing off. Don't want to cut into your time too much. This recording will be available um, and will be emailed soon, as Lynn just said. So you can always run through this again. Uh, I know there was a lot of information on this. Um, but again, go to the wiki, digest the wiki. I strongly urge you to go through the test data set before you try to um, attempt this on your own data. And good luck to you all. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Thank everyone. You. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Evan.